What is going on people and welcome back to the channel. In these next few videos I'm going to be talking about something that I consider myself to be quite good at and that is buying used cars. I'm going to share with you some of the secrets that I've learned over the years, or they're not, although they're not secrets but they are sometimes unknown things that you should look for and certainly I think nowadays some of these things have just been forgotten about because people don't know that they exist anymore. So be sure to stay tuned for the next few videos because it is guaranteed to save you some money and I hope you do learn a few things from them. Now if you click this video you're probably interested in buying a used vehicle. Now this video is quite a generalisation of all the vehicles on the market and not specific to one type or one brand. I may be doing some videos on specific types and brands, certainly the Volkswagen scene and for sure the Aston Martin what I've recently bought to highlight some of the issues you should look for for them. But this is a generalisation of all the vehicles and I bet you you will learn something from this video. So let's hit straight off then, something that I know quite a lot about because things like this happen quite a decent amount in my hometown which is Burnley and that is clocking of vehicles. Now for those that don't know clocking of vehicles, that's simply changing the mileage. Now for the old and bold amongst you, you probably think about this as rolling the wheels back and uh, changing the mileage on your clock and you probably thought with new vehicles where it's all stored digitally, it's not possible to do it. Well you would be wrong, it's actually easier to do it than it were before. Now I'm not saying that every Tom, Dick and Harry can roll back the clocks on any car, it's not that easy. What I'm saying is if you have the right software, then it is probably easier. You know, you just have to plug something in and change the mileage. But I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks to avoid getting caught by this because I think you'll be very surprised if, if we could manage to get an accurate figure of the amount of cars that have been clocked on today's roads because it will probably be a lot more than what you expect. So I think the one thing that we can all do is visual checks. Now you can see the mileage of the vehicle and then you can look at the vehicle and make sure things match up. So if you suspect this vehicle to have a little bit more mileage than maybe it's presenting, then you can start checking around for areas such as the handbrake, the gear shifter, the seat bolsters, the steering wheel. Various pieces like this can often get damaged. The rubber trims on the doors, the quality of the carpets. And although you can clock a vehicle, it's gonna be a lot more time consuming to change out all these parts. And how much wear should you really expect for that mileage of vehicle? Well, you can probably look at other vehicles on the market and compare it with it. Now, I'm not saying that this is a foolproof way of checking it, but for sure, if, you are, if you're looking at a vehicle that has 20,000 miles on it and it's got a wear similar to that of a 100,000 mile car, yes, there is a small chance that it's just had a very hard 20,000 miles, but there is a decent amount of chance that it's probably been clocked. And like I said earlier, it is way more common than you're probably thinking if you've never experienced or been stung by this sort of thing before. Now next is the foolproof way of doing it. And this all depends on the type of person that has clocked the vehicle. But when you clock a vehicle, you're changing the mileage on the odometer. This function is often integrated into software so you can change clocks on vehicles. So for example, if you had a, clock, if you had a car and the clock cluster actually broke and you went to replace that and you replaced it with a new one, the new one would read 000. So you could then change it to match your old, old mileage. Now this inherently was a dealer tool that, was, that should be used by dealers only, so they can repair the car and let it roll out of the workshop at the mileage that it came in on. But of course, over time, things like this have been leaked, and now general consumers have access to this sort of stuff. But what you can do is if you get some diagnostic systems or something that you can interrogate the ECU by, you can check the mileage of certain components on the vehicle. So certain ECUs or certain control modules on the vehicle will also hold the mileage. So if you plug it in, and it's gonna be specific. So for example, if you've got VAGCOM and you plug that in, you can see the mileage on the engine control unit. That should marry up to the mileage on the odometer reading. If any of these mileages have discrepancies in them, and there's no real reason in the service history or the vehicle documents as to why they should have discrepancies, then that's a red flag straight away. And I would stay well clear of vehicles that are displaying under mileage when control units in the vehicle are displaying a higher mileage. Now the next thing is something that I hear all too often when searching for Volkswagens. It's quite common on the market for Volkswagen owners to maybe know about the maintenance schedule or even sometimes conduct the maintenance schedules themselves. So people are fully aware that at 70,000 miles you have some major service changes that you need to be doing. Which brings me on to that. So if you're shopping for a vehicle that has, you know, 60,000 miles and it is £5,000 more than a vehicle that has 80,000 miles, I have plenty of friends that would come to me and go, yeah, I just got a 60,000 mile car for this price. Because they think, they, they just shop for the mileage. You know, they don't know too much about cars. They see lower mileage, better vehicle. 
But if you're planning on keeping that vehicle for a prolonged period of time, then yeah, that's gonna work out because you're gonna keep that vehicle and you're gonna pay for that service charge. For example, a cam belt change. But if you were just planning on using that vehicle for maybe a year or so, um, and you got the 80,000 mile one that had had the cam belt change, then that is a, is a better service condition than the previous one. The 60,000 mile one, you know needs a scheduled maintenance during your ownership. The 80,000 mile one, you might not need to do anything for it. You know, other than the standard service is what you'd expect, you might not need to do anything else to it. So I, I often get this, people often contact me about buying transporters and they compare the two and they're like, I'm gonna get this one because it's lesser mileage. I'm like, evaluate what you're getting, find out when the maintenance schedule has ha heavy price service items such as cam belts, such as DPFs, that sort of stuff, and, and compare it with one that's maybe 10,000 miles higher that has already had all this work done previously to you buying it. And I guess that goes for mileage is right the way up the range. So if your cam belt's due every 70,000 miles, then a vehicle with 140,000 miles on or 130,000 miles, you know, you might not want a 150,000 mile vehicle, but realistically, if it's had all that maintenance and it should have, it's probably better than a 130,000 mile vehicle in a cost in a cost comparison to the 130,000 mile one. Um, I'm not saying it's better. Con I'm not saying it's a better quality vehicle. Of course, that varies from vehicle to vehicle and how well it's been looked after. But as a generalisation, as maintenance costs go, you're going to be saving a little bit more money getting it on the right side of that major service schedule. So checking the owners and checking the sales history. Now, gone are the days where on a V5 you would see the previous owner. I think. Um, probably quite a few years ago now, uh, you could get a V5 and you could see who was the previous owner and people would often contact that person and be like, I'm just about to buy the car what you sold two years ago. Are there any problems that I should probably know about? And maybe the guy highlights some issues that he sold it because it had an accident and you're buying it completely fixed and it's undeclared. So in instances like that, it could save you. Now that has gone, but we do have a better tool for doing this now and that is Facebook, Google and other social media platforms and for sure Google. Google has some um, registration plate recognizing software now so you can type a registration plate into Google and it could pull up images of that vehicle. So if your vehicle was caught in an accident and maybe there's a YouTube video of that accident in some sort of accident compilation and there is a still of that and Google has picked up on the registration plate there is every chance that you will be able to find that by searching that registration plate. So do not overlook just searching your registration plate into Google. Of course, you have your standard HPI checks, which I always recommend doing with any vehicle that you're buying, but sometimes things just aren't recorded. You know, if someone has an accident and they get paid off cash, or they don't want to declare it to lose their no claims bonus, accidents often aren't recorded. So that's a good way. You can also join the owners clubs of that specific vehicle and just troll through some of the posts, you know, maybe maybe search the vehicle color, maybe search the vehicle registration plate, or you know, if you know of that vehicle being in certain meets or certain time frames, you can go back to those dates and see if there's anything about it. And for sure, look at sales posts, because when you can see a sale post, you might be able to see the last person that sold it that maybe highlighted some problems that the newer person that's selling it isn't highlighting or is trying to keep a secret. Certainly about color changes and that sort of stuff, or resprays, they could be hiding some, uh, some pretty horrible damage, which we'll go into later on in the video. Now service history, I think that goes without saying that everyone loves to check the service history. Certainly in the UK, we are sticklers for full dealer service history. That can make or break a deal for most people. I'm here to tell you that that is not that important. Now I have had services from main dealers where things haven't been changed. That customer care has not always been there when I've had services from main dealers and I've got nothing to complain about in terms of I've lost money because these services have often come in the form of um, warranty cover or you know service packages that are sold when you get the vehicle. So it's not like I've lost any physical money, but I'm the kind of guy that likes to check my air filter when I get it back from the service to make sure it's been done. And on one occasion, it wasn't. And I'm not gonna name no names, but this was a pretty major dealership. Now, I would much sooner have a service history with a trusted independent garage that relies on reputation than a larger dealership. It is great having all those stamps in your book, all those Audi stamps, all those VW stamps, all those Aston Martin stamps. They are great to have, but they are only as good as the individual that was servicing that vehicle at that particular time. People from these companies get fired all the time. Whereas your local your local garage that you know might might only turn over you know a fraction of the cost of what your local major dealership turns over. They've had the same people working for them year in, year out, and I'm sure if they fired someone for cutting corners, they'd probably mention this to the customers because the customers are their vital thing of a small business. 
um, they probably mentioned to the customers that maybe you should bring it back in for a reinspection. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case, and I wouldn't be put off buying uh, a vehicle just because it's got a uh, full service history with it, uh, or full dealer service history. That is a good thing, that is a good thing. What I'm saying is don't let that turn you off an otherwise lovely vehicle because it's not got them full dealer service stamps. I know for sure, me, I, I like to service my own stuff. That comes with no stamp, that comes with my word. But I do that because I enjoy doing it. And I'll tell you one thing for sure, is there's only one way you can guarantee that your vehicle's been serviced properly, and that is if you're doing it yourself. And I like to do that myself because I like that peace of mind. So don't be turned off by a vehicle not having a full dealer service history. It's a nice to have, but it's not a be all and end all. This is another thing that often gets overlooked, but I always like to look for, and that is tires. You might think, why would you check tires? They're quite easy, to, easy and cheap to replace. If it's got bad tires, then you can just replace them. But tires speak a thousand words in used vehicles. For sure, if you're buying a premium vehicle. You know, if you're buying a cheaper vehicle, not so much of an issue. So let's say you're going out to buy a mediocre performance family car. Let's say it is an S4. Now, if you go around to view that vehicle and it's got 60,000 miles on it and you see the tyres that are on this vehicle are all odd or cheap brands, then you can pretty much guarantee that the person servicing that vehicle doesn't really care that much about the vehicle. If you, for, for sure, if I had a car that I liked and I liked to look after, it would be getting certainly an S4, it'd be getting quality tyres on it. If you go there and it's got cheap tyres or odd tyres, they've not changed the tyre on the other side of the axle when they change one. You know, they're just trying to get it through the year, trying to get it to its next service so they can, so they can get it sold off. That's not a vehicle that you, that you want to buy. That's not a vehicle that I want to buy. So be sure to check the tyres. And like I, get, like I say with a lot of stuff on this, it's not the be all and end all, but it can just give you a bit more of a, a little bit of a red flag so you can look for other stuff to do with that vehicle. But think about what sort of tyres you put on the vehicle and what sort of tyres are on there. HPR checks. I said earlier in the video, this goes without saying, most people know nowadays to do a HPR check. If you go through a lot of vehicles like me, you can subscribe to companies that do HPR checks. I'm not going to plug any of them in particular in this video, but if you do a quick search on the Google or Apple Play Store, you'll see the most popular ones. They are very useful for telling you something hidden about the vehicle. You can also get pre-service inspections, which is basically where a professional on that vehicle or a professional mechanic comes out, takes a look at the vehicle and highlights any issues. If you're on a lot of with vehicles and you don't really know what you're looking for, I would massively recommend this. This can help you save a lot of money in the long run. But of course, I think it goes without saying, you need to factor these in at the right time. It's great to do all these things at the end. If you're going three or four hours to see a vehicle and you only HPR check it once you're there and it fails the HPR check on something that you are, you are not happy with, then that's three or four hours wasted. However, if you're just going five minutes down the road, then maybe you can just do the HPI afterwards. Also with a pre-service inspection. For me, a pre-service inspection would always be the last thing I'd do. I'd go and view the vehicle. I'd go and make sure I'm happy with the vehicle. I'd make sure it all checks out HPI. I'm happy with everything else about the vehicle. And then I would get someone in to do a pre-service inspection. People also buy vehicles remotely, so they don't even see them themselves. So they get a pre-service inspection by an independent specialist that can tell them what everything what's wrong with the vehicle. Certainly in the uh, luxury, luxury car market, you can get these done. So weigh up the pros and cons of going to see it yourself if it is far away. And always remember, HPR check and pre-service inspections are worth the weight in gold. The next thing is when you go to inspect the car. Always inspect the car in daylight and in dry weather. The rain and the darkness hides a lot. You might think this goes without saying, but I bought cars in the dark before and I've been very shocked when I got it back. You know, and I'm sure if I've done it, other people have done it as well. So learn from my mistake, make sure it is daylight. And if it is dark when you're buying it, let's say if it's winter and you can only do it after work, there's plenty of well-lit areas that you can take the car to on your test drive just to have a, a once look around. For example, car parks under supermarkets, they're always really well lit. Um, petrol forecourts, they're always really well lit. So just be aware of somewhere you can drive to that you can view the vehicle and uh, identify any issues with the paintwork because yeah, it does go without saying, I sound silly saying it, but the darkness does hide a lot of things. Now finally, um, I guess this ties in a little bit with the clocking that we talked about earlier, but that is cloning of vehicles. Now not long ago, my friend very nearly got stung with the cloning of an RS7. It was his dream car, he wanted to go buy the car, he was absolutely besotted on it. Um, to his credit, he's not that au fait with cars, he's just a massive fan of the RS7. Um, he spoke to me about it, he sent me some images of it, and as soon as I reg checked it, um, it came back as a, uh, I think, in fact, no, I did a VIN number check on it and the VIN number check came back as a three litre TDI. The reg didn't match the vehicle. 
Now, on further interrogation of this, it turns out that they'd had a three litre TDR by the registration plate that it should have through their forecourt some time ago, and they transferred the registration plate over. Fortunately, my friend, after threatening to get the police involved, he did get his refund, but he went as far as paying the deposit. And you know, if he didn't send me, send me those pictures, um, I couldn't have stopped in there and then Cloning of vehicles is very common. You can imagine how cloning of vehicles gets done and it's basically, usually it starts off an accident damaged car that's unrecorded um, that all the parts get transferred onto. So it looks like a brand new car and they might even go the, the extended effort of changing the VIN numbers and the chassis numbers on the engine and the chassis. So just be aware of that. Um, it's quite difficult to check for, but you generally, when you're buying a car, you do get a gut feeling about the person you're buying it from and there's no real foolproof way of checking this. You know, if they've gone the extra mile and changed all the numbers, unfortunately, that is what it is. Um, you could maybe use the other methods like Google and Facebook to find out if these cars have been crashed. And certainly if you're buying quite a rare car, um, for example, in me, when I bought the Aston Martin N420, there's not many of them. People were aware that they had been crashed. So they're a very difficult car to clone because people know the actual numbers of the vehicles. So in my instance, it's 420 vehicles and people already knew the number of my vehicle that had been crashed before I even bought it. Um, so it's quite hard to do on rarer cars, but certainly on more common cars and, and more common performance cars, such as your Audi RSs, your Golf Rs, that sort of stuff, they are really prone to cloning. So yeah, use your gut, use the feelings what you get when you first see the vehicle and uh, don't get besotted with that vehicle because it's so easy when you're in front of your dream car to ignore the things that are standing out and screaming at your face and only see the good. So just use that gut and I always still to this day before I buy a vehicle, I still call my dad and I still run him through the vehicle and sometimes he brings me down a peg or two, sometimes he tells me to go for it but for sure I, I don't own an Audi Q2 now because of that. Um, I was besotted with an Audi Q2 before they came out. I called my dad, I said, I'm about to put a deposit down on Audi Q2, what do you think? And he explained how much of how much money I was gonna spend on a very mediocre car. I would tell him, no, it's lovely, it's a lovely car, I really like it. And now every time I drive past one, I just look at it and think, thank goodness I don't have one of them because I was spending a lot of money on it. So be sure to, to reach out to people that you know. They don't even have to be car enthusiasts just to get their initial feeler out on it. But yeah, for sure, always contact someone before you buy a car, um, just to just to put those ill feelings at rest. Because still to this day, even when I know it's a sweet deal, I still get a little bit of an unnervy feeling because I've been ripped off in the past as I'm doing the exchange. So thanks for watching the video and thanks for sticking around this long. Drop a comment down below on the car that you're looking at purchasing and that's why you watch this video. I am very interested to see what cars are being bought off the back of this video. Be sure to drop me a comment, like and subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, then get a t-shirt because that is my revenue for making these videos for you. Other than that, guys, I'll catch you in the next video.